Oh, Father, we come before you. Thank you, Lord, for being our God, that you're the peace through all the storms we face in life, and we're so thankful for that. And we ask tonight, Lord, as we dig through Revelation chapter 9, finish up the chapter, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts and encourage us and help us to understand the things that are taking place. Uh, and Lord, as always, as we worship you, we want to honor you and bless you with these songs. We thank you, Lord, and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 9 as we continue our study through the Word of God. And as we've seen, God is pouring out his wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world, and it all began with the opening of the seven seal judgments. That brought cataclysmic events upon the earth. And just those first four seal judgments, one-fourth of the earth's population is destroyed. Uh, in Revelation 6-8, we're told that, where John wrote, So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. And then we move from those seal judgments and into the trumpet judgments, and we saw that the seventh seal judgment uh, contained the seven trumpet judgments. And four of those trumpet judgments, again, devastation upon the earth. And before the fifth judgment, our trumpet sounded, in Revelation 8, 13, this is what we're told. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. In other words, as bad as those first four trumpet judgments were, you ain't seen nothing yet. It's going to get a lot, lot worse, and we haven't even gotten to the bold judgments yet. Now, last time in our study, we looked at the fifth trumpet judgment, the first woe. And we saw that Satan was given the keys to the bottomless pit, and he opened the door and unleashed all these demons who have been chained for this judgment, and they were unleashed upon mankind. And just to show you how bad it is, it's going to be. In Revelation 9, verses 5 and 6, this is what we're told. And they were not given authority to kill them, these demons, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like a torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. So the sting these demons put upon people is so intense, like a scorpion, that men are going to want to die, but death takes a holiday for five months. And then in Revelation 9, 12, we're told one woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. So, I mean, if you thought these demons were scary from this bottomless pit, again, you ain't seen nothing yet because it's going to get worse, much worse. And we'll see that as the judgment of God continues on from the trumpet judgments through the bold judgments, those bold judgments have to be one right after another because they're so devastating, no life could be around for any per long period of time. And I always, and again, Jesus likened the tribulation period to birth pains with a, upon a pregnant woman. The pains start out pretty mild, they're not real intense, and they're far apart. But as it gets closer and closer to the delivery of the baby, the pains increase in intensity and frequency until the baby is born. And that's what we see here with the tribulation period. First, the judgments start out, they're kind of mild, but they get more intense and more frequent until the birth of the kingdom age where Jesus comes back to rule and reign for a thousand years. Now, in reading of all this judgment in a world we live in today, it's not real encouraging, right? Right? But keep in mind that for the kingdom age to come, God has to take out those who are going to reject him and would rather live apart from him in darkness. They refuse to go to the light to Jesus. Uh, let me just share this with you, and you'll see that there is light out there. I don't care how dark it is. I don't care how bleak things look. Even during these dark days we're living in, we need to understand where our focus is at. There was a morning... It was on the morning of Lincoln's death. There was 50,000 people gathered before the Exchange Building in New York. And you can imagine how the feelings were that day. Um, a well-known man 
in an officer's uniform stepped to the front of the balcony and in a voice that rang like a trumpet call, this is what he cried out, fellow citizens, clouds and darkness are round about him. His pavilion is dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Justice and judgment are the establishment of his throne. Mercy and truth go before his face. Fellow citizens, God reigns, and the government at Washington still lives. Oh, what an encouraging words. I mean, can you imagine if one of our leaders, something bad happened and one of our leaders said that? I doubt it today. That speaker was General James A. Garfield, and he was going to be a martyred president 16 years later. But he knew where his focus was. Guys, get your eyes off of what's going on here, focus on the Lord. And that's something we have to remember. God's in control. And it doesn't matter what you're going through, what I'm going through. It doesn't matter how chaotic things look in this nation and in this world. God's always in control. It's not like he takes a nap or goes on vacation. He's always in control. And we have to remember that because once we understand that he's in control, it should bring comfort to our hearts and encourage us. Hey, God's allowing this for a reason. I don't, may not understand why, and I usually don't, but I know I can trust him, and I'm going to rest in that fact. And I think for most of us, we understand that as we read the Bible and we see the things going on in the world, we know things are going to get worse and worse. Can there be a reprieve, a little revival? There always could be. But I think we're moving very quickly down that path towards the coming of the tribulation period, the establishment of a one-world government, a one-world religion, cashless society, and so on. I think it's going to happen in our lifetime. And so if we think this is bad now, you've got to hold on to your hats because it's going to get a lot worse as the darkness grows. But as dark as it may get out there, have you ever turned on a little light in a dark room and see how bright it is? That's us, guys. As dark as the world gets, gets, they can't put our light out because Jesus is with us. Never forget that. Keep your eyes focused upward and keep shining for Jesus because guess what? He's coming back. And we look forward to that day. What a, we await that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So with that as our introduction, let's begin reading in Revelation chapter 9, starting in verse 13. Let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we study his word. And John wrote this. Then the six angels sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Now, these are not the same angels we read about uh, in Revelation chapter 7, holding back the winds of judgment from blowing across the land. Back in Revelation 7, those were holy angels. Here in Revelation chapter 9, I think these are fallen angels, demons. Now, some disagree with me on that, but look at the context. I think it points to demons. How can I be so sure? Holy angels are not bound, but they willingly serve the Lord. These fallen angels, demons, have been chained for this day or bound for this day of judgment. You know, we talked about the ones that are bound in the bottomless pit, and God allows Satan to go with the key and open that pit and release them. And so this judgment, I believe, is demonic in nature. And I think these are fallen angels, just like we saw in, with the fifth trumpet's judgment. Newell wrote this. He said, most of Satan's angels are yet free being the principalities against which we wrestle, but some terrible offenders, offenders of high rank have been bound. Yeah. John, we're told in verse 13 here that John heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Now, again, whose voice is that? We're not sure. Some say it's the voice of God. It could be. I'm not going to be dogmatic about it. Um, but we see this voice calls for the release of these four angels that have been kept for this specific judgment that's going to take place at a specific period of time. And again, remember back in Revelation 6 when we saw the tribulation saints that were martyred for their faith and they're under the altar and they're asking God to intervene and deal with the injustices that 
have been done upon them to establish his kingdom on this earth. And then in Revelation 8, 5, the censer filled with incense from the al- this altar or, or the prayers of the saints is cast down to the earth in fiery judgment against the Christ-rejecting world. As we come to chapter 9, here comes the judgment from the altar of incense. God is answering the prayers of the saints. Now, we're also told of the location of this judgment, where it's coming from. It's around the area of the Euphrates River. And it begins the Euphrates River around by Mount Ararat in Turkey, flows 1,700 miles before it empties into the Persian Gulf. And besides being the natural boundary separating the east from the west, it's also the boundary of land given to the nation of Israel in Genesis 15, 18. And in Genesis 2, 14, the Euphrates River flowed from the Garden of Eden. Is it a different area? Yeah, I think so, because the flood came. Everything changed. But this, I, the Middle East is the hub of where civilization uh, came forth. Also, this is the area where we see the beginning of sin, of murder. After the flood, we see the Tower of Babel erected. Uh, later became the city of Babylon, which was the fountainhead of idolatry and occultic practices. And look at what's going on there today. Militant Islam. Look at what they're doing. Look at the number of Christians that have been put to death for their faith because they left Islam and turned their life over to Jesus. And it's out of the same area around the Euphrates River that God sends forth his judgment, the second woe of the three woes that are coming to pass, the sixth trumpet judgment. Now, remember back with the fifth trumpet judgment in Revelation 9, this bottomless pit, a shaft you might say, from this bottomless pit went up to the surface of the earth so that as Satan opened that door, these demonic beings came forward. I think, well, where is the shaft located? Well, as I said last time, if it's bottomless, it's got to be in the center of the earth because there's no bottom when you're in the center. Everything is upward. Um, and is it possible that this shaft is somewhere by the Euphrates River? I think so. I mean, you look at all the things that, all the occultic stuff going on in this area, very much could be. Um, we don't know for sure, but... It is interesting to look at that. We know this judgment is coming from that area. And look at what verse 15 says. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Do you see the difference from these, uh, from the demonic locusts we read of with the fifth trumpet? They were only allowed to torment men for how long? Five months. Five months. Not kill them. Torment them. So much so that they want to die and they can't die for five months. But here, God gave these demons the authority to kill. And not just kill, but kill on a massive scale. And I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. And they're prepared for a specific period of time. Now, does it mean that this judgment's going to be 13 months and 25 hours? Could be. You know, that's what it seems to be saying. But may not necessarily be that specific time period. I think the point that's being made here is there's a specific time when these angels are going to be released and they're going to cause death and destruction upon the earth. There's a divine plan to be carried out and it's going to be carried out. The exact hour of God's judgment is going to come to pass. One writer said these angelic ministers of judgment act under divine control. They cannot act without express command. Absolutely. And there's always a, a, a time that God has. There was a time when Jesus was to be born, that God was going to become flesh and dwell among us. And it was at that perfect time. I mean, think about it. During, when Jesus was born, the Greek lam- language spread throughout the world. Most people understood the Greek language. So when the gospel was sent forth, it was easy to understand because everyone knew Greek. Did they speak Aramaic? Of course they did. Did they speak Hebrew? Of course they did. But the main language was Greek at that period of time. Now, 
for us, and I, I guess I could speak for myself, waiting upon God is the hardest thing to do, isn't it? I mean, we're all pretty, I think we're all in the same boat, Lord, come quickly, right? Maranatha. Um, but he has this t- a perfect time for everything, and it's hard to wait. But we can waste a lot of energy, we can become very frustrated when we try to help God out. It doesn't work. We need to wait upon the Lord. In fact, that's what we're told in Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Waiting upon God is never wasted time. It's a time of growth and preparation for the work that God has called you to do. It's a time of refreshing as you wait upon God. And it's not just sit around and do nothing. But as you're serving the Lord, he's going to guide you, he'll direct you, he'll lead you in what to do and where to go. And I like that. And, you know, he'll carry us. I I do like that also. In other words, it's not going to be in my strength. It's not going to be in my power. It's going to be in his. And how comforting that is to know. You know, God is never going to call you to do something that he's not equipping you to do. He's never going to call you to do something that he's not prepared the work already for you. Wow. He's already prepared the work. Now he just wants me to walk. Yeah, exactly. To everything there is a season, like it says in Ecclesiastes. And here it's divine judgment that's coming upon the land. And with the fourth seal, we saw one-fourth of the Inhabitants of the earth killed maybe two, two and a quarter billion people. And with the sixth trumpet blast, we see another one-third of the inhabitants of the earth killed. So if we're down to six billion people after the first four judgments, then one-third of six billion is another two billion people were killed. We're down to four billion people. But let's think about this, because we haven't filtered out those Christians who were raptured before the tribulation period. That's a group of people. We haven't filtered out those earth dwellers who died in the other, you know, seal judgments or even the first four trumpet judgments. We haven't filtered out the multitude of those who've come to faith during the tribulation period and have been martyred for their faith. So, yeah, it could be well under four billion people. And I don't know if we can even comprehend death on this scale. We've never seen it before except in the flood, but no one really saw the effects like we would see here. It's a slaughterhouse. The carnage is incredible. And out of all that death, there's disease, pestilence that comes forth. And here's the thing. If you've listened to some of the news and what some of the movers and shakers are saying, they feel that the world's population is much, much too high. We must decrease the world's population and not by just you know a little not by just a million here or a million there these movers and shakers of society feel the earth's population should be less than 500 million people we're at 8 billion people 500 million can you imagine how are they going to do that who's going to determine who lives and who dies to bring those numbers down i guarantee you none of those movers and shakers will die because they're too valuable. At least that's what they think. And I think before all that happens, I think God's going to intervene before they even can do anything about that. But I'm going to share something with you, and you'll see how creepy it is and what they're promoting. I'll show some pictures after the study of what these stones look like, but they're called Georgia Guide Stones. And this is what we're told about it. Mysterious stones raised in the southern U.S. have been at the heart of conspiracy theories claiming billions should die in order to keep the world. The Georgia Guidestones, massive granite slabs that stand on a hill about nine miles north of the city of Elberton, have been called the American Stonehenge by some online. While visitors have been drawn to the unusual structure's design, many described an uneasy feeling when approaching the stones and reading its apparently sinister inscriptions. Raised at the height of the Cold War by a man using the false name Robert C. Christian, I think that's kind of interesting, on behalf of a small group of loyal Americans, the stones seemingly offer guidance for people across the world. 
Written in eight major world languages, the stones present their own twisted take on the Ten Commandments, as many passages appearing to advocate large-scale population control, eugenics, and globalism. Among its more strange passages include maintaining humanity under 500 million. Wow. Guide reproduction wisely and urging nations to resolve disputes in a world court. What are we talking about? We're talking about a global government. And a passage on population control, its passage on population control has drawn particular attention as the number of people on earth in 1979 when the structure was built was 4.4 billion. We're almost at 8 billion. Imagine trying to bring that number down. Isn't that crazy? But God's going to take care of that as he pours out his wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world. It doesn't matter what they're trying to do. Joe Farah from World Net Daily, in an article published way back in 2007, isn't it kind of strange to say way back in 2007? But here we are in 2021, right? Almost 2022. This is what he wrote. There's no question the CFR, Council on Foreign Relations, is a club for wealthy elite power brokers who want or already do rule the world. But how do they plan to do it? How do spin-off groups like the Trilateral Commission and those with interlocking memberships such as the Bilderbergers plan to create a one-world government? Some, including author Daniel Estelan in his new book, The True Story of the Bilderberg Group, have offered evidence of plans by the globalists to depopulate the world, to crush the middle class, and to reduce most people to mere serfs or a slave bound to work. You see what's going on in our country? That's exactly what they're doing. Again, socialism. you got to control the people. And how do you control the people? The government takes care of you from birth to death and everything in between. We have control of your life. You want to go shopping? Well, you better get this vaccine. You want to do this? Well, you better have this done. You better play by these rules or we're not going to give you what you need to live by. Very interesting. This is what we're moving towards. And all I can say is praise God he's coming back. And Lord, give us the strength to be powerful witnesses in this day that is getting very dark. Well, look at verse 16. We think it's just the four angels or four demons, I should say. Well, look at verse 16. The number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red. Uh, Hanseneth, blue, sorry. I tried to get, pronounce that word earlier today, and I still can't. And sulfur, yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone, which came out of their mouths for their power is in their mouth and in their tails for their tails are like serpents having heads and with them they do harm the fifth trumpet judgment again saw demons unleashed from the abyss to inflict pain upon earth dwellers here with this sixth trumpet some believe that these are demons unleashed to kill one third of the inhabitants of the earth others see it as a literal military army that's coming across the land I'm going to share both views, and then I'll tell you what I think is going on here, and you can come to your own conclusion. Uh, is the number 200 literal or symbolic? I think it can be very literal. I see no problem with that. Um, whatever it is, it's a huge number. There's never been an army that big. Uh, in fact, right now, and again, there's speculation on this, the, if it's true or not, but... Uh, China has a militia of 200 million. They talked about it way back in, on May 21st, 1965 in Time Magazine, page 35, um, that they claim to have an army of that big. Napoleon said China is a sleeping giant, and God pity the generation that wakes her up. Now, those that feel that this is a literal army, and probably China, feel that corresponding to the sixth trumpet is the six bold judgments spoken of in Revelation chapter 16, where we read this in verses 12 through 16. 
Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to a place called in Hebrew Armageddon. What is a place that's east of Israel? Well, China. And the Euphrates River runs 1,700 miles, like I said. It's anywhere from 3 to 12 miles wide. Average depth is about 30 feet. So it's a natural barrier between the eastern and western empires. How would you move 200 million soldiers across this river? Even if you did it by boat, could you imagine the time it would take? I mean, come on. It's way too long. But God's going to dry up the Euphrates River. Um, and there's a great dam in Turkey which crosses the Euphrates River. And it has the ability to dry it up. Does God need that dam? No, he doesn't. He could dry it up just like that. But it's very possible that that's what he's going to do. Uh, and it's going to be stopped so these, this military can cross through. They're gathering together in the valley of Megiddo, Armageddon. Now, if you took 200 million soldiers, marched them shoulder to shoulder, you would have a massive troop movement, obviously. One mile wide, 87 miles long. Oh, my gosh, right? And in the book of Daniel, we're told that the Antichrist moves to take control of the world. There's some uprisings going on. Some of the leaders aren't obeying him. Um, and as he goes down to North Africa, he gets word there's a massive troop movement against him, and he turns back northward to deal with this insurrection. In Daniel eleven forty four, it says, But news from the east and the north shall trouble him, therefore he shall go out with fury, with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. So as this math, massive army moves further westward, some of the troops move from the, the north area, because it's easier to split the troops up, and half from the east, and they meet the Antichrist and his forces in the valley of Megiddo. That's the final co conflict before Christ returns to set up his kingdom on earth. And I believe it's here that this army turns against Jerusalem and they come down against the Jewish people and God does battle with them here. Now, I think in Revelation 16, it's a literal army that's being spoken of. And I used to think that this here in Revelation 9 was a literal army. I tend to think that this is more demonic in nature. One of the reasons is they're going to kill two billion people. And it's pretty hard for an army to do that. Nuclear weapons, yeah, you know, I guess so, but uh, we don't see anything really mentioned of nuclear war in these passages or some massive explosions or anything. Um, and I know that the description here in Revelation chapter 9, some see this you know, John in his day could only expound on what he knew. They, they didn't have weapons like we do today, and they see these as, you know, helicopters and different things, tanks and things like that. Um, possibly. Um, you know, it's possible. But, again, look at verse 17 here in Revelation chapter 9 about the, these horses. And the heads of the horses were like heads of lions, and out of their mouth came... Fire, smoke, and brimstone. Have you ever seen a horse do that? Well, that's why some say, well, it's a tank. Uh, but John knew of horses. Those were military weapons in those days. So maybe he's describing a tank. Um, possibly. Um, again, sometimes I think we're trying to read too much into uh, 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 this book of Revelation. And we have to be careful. Um, I tend to, I, like I said, I, I kind of saw this as a physical army, but now I really see them as demons. Um, David Guzak wrote, But a human army this size has never been seen. The total size of all armies on both sides at the height of the Second World War was only 70 million. 
1965, China claimed to have an army and militia of 200 million, but this claim was doubted by many. Even if such an army was assembled and marched towards the West, it's hard, it is hard but not impossible to see such an army killing a billion or more people, a third of mankind. Therefore, perhaps the safest interpretation is not to see this as a literal 200 million strong army, but a demonic army invading Earth. This continues the idea of the demonic army like locusts described earlier in this chapter. Um, and I think that's true. I think this is, these are demons. Um, and remember what we read in verses 13 and 14. The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. I think these four very demonic fallen angels, once they're released, they gather this demonic army. And maybe they split the 200 million into four parts. Each of these demons, military demons, have, you know, a quarter of the, this army. It's very possible. And here's the key for me. The sixth trumpet judgment and the sixth bowl judgment happen at different times. They're not happening at the same time. Remember, the trumpet judgments come first, and then we have the bowl judgments, and we have seven bowl judgments that have to come forth. So I don't think what we read here in Revelation chapter 9 is related to what we read in Revelation chapter 16 because they're different judgments of God. I think this is taking place right here at this period of time when these angels are released, not the battle of Armageddon during that period of time. I like what Donald Gray Barnhouse wrote. He said, it might be well to point out also that so far as Asia is concerned, demon religions are all east of the Euphrates River. India is said to have 33 million gods, and we are told in the Bible that all the gods of the heathen are demons. Yeah, I mean, think about what is being worshipped in that part of the world. All the demonic activity that's going on. And then here, it's all unleashed upon mankind. A pretty huge destruction, to say the least, right? We can't even comprehend what this is going to be like. Not even close. Look at verse 20. But the rest of mankind who are not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. When you read this and see all that's been taking place upon the people of this planet, don't you think that they would repent? Don't you think that they would say, Uncle, right? And turn to the Lord. Okay, Lord, we are sorry we repent. They know where the judgment's coming from. But again, their hearts are so hard, they refuse to repent. And they're going to rather worship the Antichrist and Satan himself rather than Jesus Christ. We saw that in Revelation 6, verses 12 through 17. Where John said, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. And the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? You see, it's not a matter of the intellect, guys. 
They know where this judgment's coming from. It's a matter of the heart, and they refuse to come to Jesus. They'd rather have the rocks and mountains fall on them and hide them. But can you really hide from God? No, you can't. And those who are rejecting the Lord, we see what's manifested in their lives. In these two verses, there's five things in which they refuse to repent of. And I think they cover the two tables of the law, that which dealt with man's relationship with God and that which dealt with man's relationship with his fellow man. In Revelation 9.20, we see that they're into idolatry, and that's nothing more than demon worship. The first table of the law, who are they worshiping? The Antichrist, right? And idolatry is a big part of the last day scenario. And it's, again, years ago I used to think that the world's going to get less and less religious. And I guess I just didn't read my Bible enough because the world is getting more religious. I'm not saying they're coming to Jesus. What I'm saying is they're very spiritual. And they've opened themselves up to all kinds of demonic activity. And we see a lot of that today. You look at some, what, what some of these churches are getting into. I'll tell you, you want to freak yourself out, go watch some of this stuff with holy laughter and being drunk in the spirit. And you go, this is demonic in nature. This is not of God. In fact, God condemns that kind of activity. In fact, in, I think it's in Isaiah. God says, I'm going to make you drunk, but not with wine. That's exactly what drunk in the spirit is. They, they're so drunk that they have to have designated drivers. Are you kidding me? That's not what the Bible says. I watched one segment, and I think it was uh, Kenneth Hagen. It was up on stage, packed out house. I mean, they're packing them out. And he's slaying people in the spirit, and they're falling over in their chairs. And then he's drunk in the spirit, and people are drunk, and they can hardly stand up. And he had to get his bodyguards who are around him to help him to get to his chair because he's so drunk he can't even walk anymore. And he sits down and he's so drunk that he looks at his watch to see what time it is. I thought, you creep, you. You're a liar. You're a deceiver. And you're deceiving these people. Do you see how demonic this stuff can be? Even in the church. Well, how do we know if it's of God or not? Is it in the word of God? Where do you see drunk in the spirit? Where do you see holy laughter? Where do you see being glued to the floor where you can't remove yourself? You'll never find it. And for most people, it's a show. They just act. They pretend. So idolatry, yeah. People are into all that kind of stuff. And I think the big thing for the last days, I wasn't really going to get into this, but is the lie. What's the lie? The, the lie is from the Garden of Eden. When Satan said to Eve, you shall not die. There's no judgment of God. And if you eat of this fruit, you will be like what? God. There it is. And look at the push today. New Agers have been saying this for years. We're God. We just don't remember. We, we have to remember we're God. Well, you know, I am forgetful. I forget where I put my keys. But if you forget that you're God, you got a serious problem, right? We're not. But this is part of the lie. And we see it in the church. You look at some, these health, wealth, and prosperity teachers. They will say we're little gods. Dogs have puppies, cats have kittens, and God has little gods. It's a lie of the devil. God says, I will have no other gods before me. There is one God, yes, manifested in three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But there is only one God, and it's not me, it's not you. we got to remember that. And is it amazing what people worship today? I remember it was years ago, I think it was up in Green Bay or somewhere, um, that uh, the saint for uh, lost things was stolen well where do you go now the god who finds lost things was stolen who are you going to go to that's how crazy it is we 
go to the woods, we take a, a piece of wood, we carve an image on it, and we worship it. Are you kidding me? But that's what we do instead of worshiping the living God. Remember that at this point now, the Antichrist has already gone into the Holy of Holies, the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And we'll talk about the rebuilt temple when we get to Revelation chapter 11. But he goes in there at the three and a half year mark of the seven year tribulation period, demands to be worshiped as God. And that's when the Jews flee to the mountains, to Petra. The world will worship him as God. And I think it's at that point when Satan, or when the Antichrist goes into the Holy of Holies and demands to be worshipped as God, I think Satan enters him. And when you see his actions after that, it's demonic in nature. Henry Morris wrote this. He said, For many years prior to Christ's return for his saints, there will have been a revival of occultism, astrology, spiritism, and kindred doctrines of demons, even in Western cultures, preparing the minds of men everywhere for a worldwide return to pagan idolatry in the final days of the cosmic rebellion. Absolutely. I showed you before that we, there's, there's Christian witches out there. You think, are we that biblically illiterate that we know that, that we agree and say, yeah, she must be a Christian witch? Are you kidding me? But that's where we, how far we have come. We have Bethel Church using tarot cards, but they're Christian tarot cards. I, that's like saying Christian yoga. It's like an it's an oxymoron. You're being with yoga. You're being united with the God, with the Kundalini force. Oh, but that, and it's just stretching. Understand, yoga is just not stretching. You could stretch. You don't have to do yoga. Yoga is working. These demonic creatures are working in your mind if you're involved in that kind of activity. He goes on to say, great worship centers will then be erected with grotesque images of modern art depicting the various cosmic and terrestrial forces and processes, presumably controlled by the principalities and powers of the wicked one, and these will become objects of worship, with men and women in effect thus worshiping those evil spirits which they portray and represent. Worshiping idols of gold and silver, brass and stone, and wood is, of course, the same as worshiping the demons who are associated with them. It's just like the Roman Catholic Church that put up the big statue at the Colosseum of the god Moloch for people to go and see. Why would you put a statue of Moloch? Moloch was a false god, demonic creature in which they would offer their children as sacrifices as they placed this image, this brown image, in the fire, heated up the hands, and they would place their children on them. And the Jews did the same thing, and they would beat drums so they didn't hear the screaming of the children. Are you kidding me? We go, how barbaric. Well, we do the same thing. It's called abortion. We haven't learned. I know it's hard to believe that idolatry is growing today, but it is. New Age, Eastern mysticism, and so on. Do you really see New Age bookstores anymore? You really don't, do you? Because you know where they're at? In Christian bookstores. That's where they're at. They've infiltrated the Christian market. I can go on and on on this. I won't. But like the Course in Miracles... Okay, well, why are Christians involved in that? It's demonic. Jesus calling, are you kidding me? He already called. I've got his word right here. It's already transcribed for me. I don't need another calling from Jesus. It's demonic. And if it wasn't, why did she have to make rewrites to correct errors that were in there? If Jesus was really calling her, there would be no heirs, and there's plenty. I like what Psalm 115 says. Their idols are silver and gold, their work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. 
They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. That's a true statement. We become like the gods we create. Maybe it's materialism, sex, drugs, whatever. Those could be idols in our lives. And why are people so prone to get involved to these things? I think the main reason is there's a God-shaped void in their heart that they are trying to fill apart from God, and it will never be filled. The only way you will be satisfied, content, is by allowing Jesus Christ into your life because that will fill the void that is there. Everything else won't. And that's why people move from one thing to another to another. And whatever God you serve, you will become like them. That's just the way it is. We serve the living God, and our desire is to become like him. His nature flowing through our lives. Now, I like that our God is not dead. I know some people like to say he is. He's not. The tomb's empty. He's living. He's able to respond to our heart's cry. Psalm 116.1, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Aren't you thankful for that? You know, these people that aren't talking to the true and living God are talking to demons. But we talk to the true and living God, and he answers every prayer we give to him. Every prayer that we speak forth. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, and sometimes it's not yet. But he answers them. And he knows what's best for our lives. Again, here in Revelation 9, verse 21, John speaks of murders, mind-altering drugs, fornication, stealing. The second table of the law. And if your relationship with God is askew, if it's off, then your relationship with everyone else will be off. That's just the way it is. They don't have the Spirit of God to guide them down the right path. And so the things that are manifested in their lives, they don't bother them anymore. Their conscience becomes seared with a hot iron. So those feelings that something is, that you're doing is wrong go away because God has built in us a conscience. We know what's right and wrong, but we can sear it. And keep doing the wrong thing over and over and over again. And then we lose the feeling. We see lawlessness growing, don't we? Have you ever thought that you would see all the violence, destruction, burning of buildings, uh, all that stuff, and the news media and the politicians praise it? Have you ever thought that you would see something like that? But that's the mindset. Why do we see churches joining Black Lives Matter and Antiva? I don't understand that. Idolatry, violent crimes, murder, immorality, just flowing. And again, who would have ever thought Superman was gay, right? But now he's gay. I told my wife, you know, when you wear leotards all the time, you know, that could be a problem. But, but see, this is what they're doing. They're changing everything to fit what they want. Be careful you don't get sucked into it. And here's the thing. They don't have the Spirit of God in them. So what, what other creatures don't have the Spirit of God in them? Well, wild animals. So look at the behavior. They're like wild animals. You know, it, what was it in New York that a woman was raped in a subway station and no one did anything? I'm thinking, what is wrong with us? Can we, are we so busy with our phones we, no one saw it? Or do we just ignore it? 
We're led by the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God dwells in us, and it helps keep that flesh under control. Not that we're perfect, but man, what should flow from our lives is the love of God. You see, I think in Galatians 5, when it's talking about the fruit of the Spirit, I think love is the fruit of the Spirit. It's singular, fruit of the Spirit. What's manifested out of that love, that agape love? Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What are you feeding your spiritual life with? The things of God or the things of this world? Whatever you feed is what's going to be manifested in your life. One writer said, one of the clearest proofs of the depravity of man is his in." Implacable hatred of the only solution to his greatest problem. Yeah. What's the only solution? Jesus. But they refuse to repent. They suppress the truths of God. We see that today. And God says, I'm giving you over to these wicked things, debased mind, activities. I'm giving you over because you've rejected me. You have all the proof you need. Heaven declares the glory of God. All you have to do is look at creation. You see, there is a God. And in his word, he reveals himself to us, who he is, and, he, and the relationship he wants to have with us. Jesus Christ is the only solution to man's problems. Years ago, probably some 24 or 5 years ago in Chicago, they had all these... Uh, shootings going on well they kind of like today but this was their solution to their problem we need to have midnight basketball games for these guys that's the solution now the solution is jesus christ because he's the only one that can change a life midnight basketball did it work no look at the violence with the in chicago i think they had one day 24 hour period of time there were no killings in chicago and they all wanted to celebrate and you go, wow, you're excited because you didn't have one murder in 24 hours? I don't know if I'd celebrate that. That's a pretty sad statement that you're excited because in 24 hours no one was murdered. But that's what we're seeing today. Here's the thing. If you're hungry, if you're thirsty, focus yourself on God. He's the bread of life. You'll never hunger. He's the living water. You'll never thirst. Draw close to him. Satisfaction's found in him. Ray Steadman put it like this. He said, this is where this passage leaves us, and I want to leave it at that point. I've been writing a commentary on the book of Hebrews, and I've been struck by a question that the writer asks in the second chapter, which is really the theme of Hebrews. He asks, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How can you escape if you neglect the offer of the grace of God? God does not want to judge men. He does not like judgment. But that is all that is left for those who reject the way of escape, which the grace of, and mercy of God supplies. Wow. How true. You know, people have a really wrong picture of God. They think he's oh, so judgmental and hateful and angry and no, he's not. He's a loving God. If we truly knew everything that is going on in this world, everything, like God does, I think we would have smote everyone. But God is patient. He's long-suffering. He's very gracious and merciful, and he's giving people an opportunity to repent and get right. But if they don't want to, judgment will come. You won't escape the judgment of God. Today is the day of salvation. It's not time to pass it up. And I realize, you know, as we've been going through these judgments, it's pretty heavy material, right? But we're going to get a little break in Revelation chapters 10 and 11 before the seventh judgment. And then, you know, we do get a little break in 12 and 13 and 14 again uh, before we get to 15. Chapter 15 deals with kind of a preparation for the bold judgments. And then in chapter 16, we get the last uh, judgments of God, the bold judgments come forth. But what John is going to do over the next pretty much several chapters is fill in the details 
Again, before we get to the seventh trumpet judgment and then to the bold judgments uh, after that, a little breather. And I'll leave you with this. In Jeremiah 29, 11, this is what the Lord says. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. May we remember that? You know, we look at all the things that are going on and we think, God, where are you? What's going on? I don't understand this. How could this be happening? I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. God wants to give us a future and a hope. The question, I guess, has to be, where is your future and hope? Is it in this government? Is it in this nation? Is it in your job? Is it in Jesus? In this world, you will have tribulation, but in Jesus, we'll have peace. Let's put our hope, our faith, our trust in him, no matter what comes our way. May we remember the thoughts that God has towards us, peace and not of evil to give us a future and a hope. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your hope and comfort and peace even in the days we're living in. And Lord, we pray that you would give us a boldness like we never had before, a boldness to bring the gospel message to the lost, opportunities to share our faith, that you would remove the blinders from their eyes and soften their heart, that they would come to saving faith. Help us, Lord, not to become cold and insensitive, but to have that agape love a love that reaches out to people like you do, Lord. And may many come into the kingdom. We thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.